Growing up in the days uh, before people had television sets, all of us kids on Saturday would always go to the movies, to the matinee, and then we'd go off to the parish church for Saturday confession. As my dad used to tell us, when it's time to get your hair cut, it's time to go to confession. He presumed that our sins grew as fast as our hair did. Those matinees would begin at about one o'clock in the afternoon, and typically they were westerns. It cost 25 cents to get in. It was a double feature, a newsreel. In those days, there was no CNN. A couple of cartoons, and then a serial film that was continued week to week. And it always ended in a very dramatic scene geared to bring the audience back to see if the hero who fell from an airplane without a parachute into shark-infested waters, while at the same time under fire from poison that starts from pygmies, will he survive? Well, of course he would, but you had to come back next Saturday to find out how. Actually, Westerns in those days comprised about one-fourth of all the 20th century films, and also about one-fourth of primetime television when television came into its own. The hero cowboy was always a rugged individual completely self-reliant and who by his own efforts and determination was able to overcome all adversity. Our cowboy heroes were joined by Ayn Rand heroes, the private detectives of the uh, noir genre, Rambo, Rocky, Luke Skywalker, and all of these figures betokened a certain individualism and competition that became a very important expression of our national values as personified in these cultural icons. To a certain extent, these rugged individuals who enjoyed hero status have been supplanted by our celebrities, many of whom are simply famous for being famous, and we often have no idea how they entered into our consciousness. We love them for being who they are, not what they've done. Sometimes celebrity is warranted by talent in singing, sports, entertainment, or being of great intellectual prowess or good looks. And because we live in a culture that's addicted to entertainment, celebrities are a very important part of our lives. I often share with people the story of how I was once invited to a state dinner at the White House. The president of Brazil was visiting, and they wanted to have a Portuguese-speaking bishop there. When an O'Malley showed up, I think they were all very surprised. But they sat me down next to President Bush, who was the head of state at that moment, I recognized immediately. And on my other side was a lovely young lady who introduced herself as Gloria Estefan. And I said to her, do you work in the White House? She said, no, Father. I'm a famous singer. I said, you obviously don't sing Gregorian chant. She was a good sport about it all and understood that a poor friar might not be totally conversant with pop culture. Yet the truth is that we're all emerged in a culture that lionizes celebrities and often presents heroes and heroines who are the embodiment of extreme individualism that is rampant in our society. In the church, we have our saints as our role models and heroes. The truth is, we were placed on this earth to take care of each other. For the unbeliever, the universe and life itself are the results of chance, of an accident. But for the believer, The universe and our life are the result of love. This is the fundamental difference. So often, the popular culture and media, who are the great proselytizers of the age, preach the most stultifying kind of consumer existence, convincing us that to worship gods of commerce and money and selfish advancement are above all else. We are told that all that really matters is to acquire things, to wear the right clothes, 
to drive the right cars, to live in the right place, then everything will be all right. The truth is that the inevitable losses and sufferings that invade even the most carefully planned and orchestrated life have a way of disrupting things. A life of faith with a sense of purpose and mission is what brings us fulfillment. In our world where people put their philosophy of life on their bumper stickers and on their t-shirts, I saw a great t-shirt once that said, the one who has the most money when he dies wins. It sounds pretty absurd on a t-shirt, but many lead their lives as if that's what it were all about. It is only by being part of a community of faith, to be part of a worshiping community that can sustain us and nurture our idealism and sense of purpose. I know that today it's popular saying is, oh, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. That means I can have a relationship with God without being part of the church. However, Jesus, the bridegroom, is never a widower. He doesn't exist separate from his bride, the church. Jesus has taught us very clearly that discipleship is never a solo flight. We learn to be people of faith the way that we learn a language, by being part of a community that speaks that language. Recently, I was invited to a great Marian shrine in Altating in Bavaria to celebrate a mass in the cell of St. Conrad, a Capuchin brother who was the porter in that shrine for 40 years. In his tiny porter's room, there were two windows, one that allowed the saint to see the tabernacle in the church. And the other window faced the road, and through that window, St. Conrad could see the throngs of pilgrims of suffering humanity approaching the shrine, coming for help to cope with hunger and poverty. And they came also seeking mercy and forgiveness for their sins. Those two windows, for me, represent the path of St. Conrad's holiness. Pope Francis, in his Reflections on Holiness, underscores the centrality of prayer and community. St. Conrad's windows that opened the path to holiness in his life were precisely prayer, the window on the tabernacle, and the community, the window on the pilgrims. Holiness consists in an habitual openness to the transcendent, expressed in prayer and in adoration. Holiness is nurtured in community, where we learn to wash each other's feet, as Jesus taught us at the first Eucharist. In a world with so many divisions and so much individualism that threaten our planet, the antidote is holiness. Our community of faith has responsibility to prepare the world to bring healing and peace by, by unleashing the power of love that is holiness. That is what humanizes us and perfects God's image in us. We're made in the image and likeness of God, and that's the source of our dignity. That image is made manifest when we live in God's love as protectors and caregivers of those around us, indeed of the very planet, our common home. The world has enough cowboys and celebrities. We need men and women capable of loving and serving, who, like Christ, are prepared to make a gift of themselves. God has made us for friendship, not to be isolated as autonomous selves that seek only one's own advantage and well-being apart from others. Recently, Pope Francis published a very moving invitation to embrace our vocation to holiness in his Gaudete et Exultate. To be holy is to be fully human. It's to realize our full potentiality. Our task is to help people to be fully human, to grow in sanctity. As Pope Francis says, don't be afraid of holiness. It won't take away any of your energy or vitality or joy. On the contrary, 
You will become what the Father had in mind when he created you, and you will be faithful to your deepest self. To depend on God sets us free from every form of enslavement and leads us to recognize our great dignity. The Holy Father urges us to set our sights higher, to allow us to be loved and liberated by God. He says, holiness does not make you less human. It's an, it's an encounter between our weakness and the power of God's grace. For in the words of Leon Bloy, who used to say that the only great tragedy in life is not to become a saint. Francis gives us a very accessible, practical lesson on Christian holiness. He shows us that holiness is following Jesus, experiencing the mysteries of his life. It consists in being united in his death and resurrection, but also reproducing in our own lives the various aspects of Jesus' earthly life, his hidden life at Nazareth, a life of family, prayer, hospitality, and work. It means experiencing his life in a community with the apostles and disciples, his closeness to the outcast, the simplicity of his lifestyle, and the words and the deeds that betoken his self-sacrificing love. Pope Francis holds up the Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitude as the Christian's identity card. So if anyone asks what we must do to be good Christians, the answer is clear. We have to do each in our own way what Jesus told us to do in the Sermon on the Mount. In the Beatitudes with their promises of happiness to those who are poor, meek, peacemakers, compassionate, we find a portrait of the Master which we are called upon to reflect in our own lives. We must let the Sermon on the Mount, unsettle us, challenge us, and demand a real change in the way that we live our lives. In the 25th chapter of Matthew, Jesus expands on the beatitude that calls the merciful blessed. That gospel reflects the holiness pleasing in God's eyes and the one criterion on which we will be judged. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me to drink. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me." The Gospel passage is not a simple invitation to charity. It is, as Pope Francis says, a page of Christology that sheds a ray of light on the mystery of Christ, and in this call to recognize him in the poor and the suffering. We see revealed the very heart of Jesus, his deepest feelings and choices, which every saint seeks to imitate. We're called upon to be protectors and caregivers. We must not be indifferent to the suffering and the injustice on our doorstep. Our very existence is a result of love. In our connectedness to God, we're connected to one another, and our God has entrusted this world to us. Our task is, as our Jewish brothers and sisters say, to repair the world. And our world needs a lot of repair, a lot of caregivers and protectors. Lone rangers and celebrities won't cut it. We need saints. Every year I accompany hundreds of young people to Washington, D.C. for the pro-life march in January. One year while we were in Washington, we went to visit the Holocaust Museum. I was struck by a letter that was projected on the walls of the museum. It was a letter addressed to educators from a man by the name of Chaim Gannat. And he writes, my eyes have seen what no man should witness, gas chambers built by learned engineers, children poisoned by educated physicians, infants killed by trained nurses, women and children shot and burned by high school and college graduates. So I'm suspicious of education. My request is help your students to become 
more human. Your efforts must never produce learned monsters, skilled psychopaths, educated Eichmanns. Reading, writing, arithmetic are important only if they serve to make people more human. We've all seen how science and technology can be put at the service of evil and selfishness. At home we have a great photograph in the family album of my grandparents, my Irish grandparents, who had the first automobile in our town. And, and there's pictures of them in their white dusters and goggles, and my grandfather wearing this leather cap, and my grandmother in a big bonnet tied firmly under her chin with a scarf as they prepared themselves for these life-threatening velocities of 15 miles an hour. But before they died, my grandparents lived to see a man placed on the moon. The 20th century was the greatest century of scientific and technological progress in the history of humanity. Television, the internet, telecommunications, cures and treatments for so many diseases that had been fatal. So many wonderful discoveries and inventions that have made our life easier and richer. But at the same time, the 20th century was the most violent century in the history of humanity. Two world wars, the Holocaust, the atom bomb, apartheid, legalized abortion, and many examples of the destruction of people, abuse of the environment, and the eroding values. And that's why Chaim Gnaut's letter is so prophetic. Science and technology can expand our knowledge of the world around us, but they can never teach us the value of things or the meaning of our existence, the purpose and mission of our life. Our faith, on the other hand, is a light that helps us to see deeper into reality, to discover the loving presence of God. And in discovering God, we discover who we are, why we're here, what the purpose of our life is, what our mission is. Yes, this wisdom begins when we discover how awesome God is, how great. Then we're discovered that we're not here by accident. We're here as a result of God's love, and our life has a purpose. Being a protector and a caregiver demands courage and generosity. These are the people that are repairing the world and holding our hope for the future, the brave and the generous. Solidarity is an expression of the great commandment that calls us to form community among people that will enable us to overcome the structures of sin and oppression. Above the human and natural bonds already so strong, faith leads us to see a new model of the unity of the human race. The Holy Father insists that solidarity isn't sentimentality or a vague compassion or empathy for the suffering of so many, but rather it's a firm and persevering determination to commit oneself to the common good because we're all really responsible for all. Solidarity is about being protectors of the gifts and caretakers of each other. The Japanese have a wonderful parable that I often share with people about a man who lived in a magnificent home on the top of a mountain. And each day he would go out and take a walk in his garden and look at the sea down below. And one day as he was out walking, he saw this huge tsunami rushing toward the shore. And then he noticed a group of his neighbors were having a picnic on the beach. And so he wanted to warn them. He began to wave his arms and shout, but they were so far away they couldn't see him or hear him. So you know what that man did? He went into his beautiful home and he set it on fire. And when his neighbors looked up and saw the smoke and the flames, some of them said, let's climb the mountain and help our neighbor to save his home. And the other said, oh, that mountain is so steep and we're having so much fun. You go. Well, the ones who climbed the mountain to help their neighbor were saved. And those who 
stayed on the beach having fun when the tidal wave hit the shore were swept out to sea and they perished. Too often when we perform a work of mercy or a work of justice, we think that we're doing God a favor, but actually we're climbing that mountain of love that draws us closer to God and to salvation. The only real success in life is making a gift of oneself. This is a success that we wish for all of us, that we be capable of making a gift of our lives to God and to others. And in so doing, we will become protectors of the gifts and caretakers of each other. In a sign of hope in a world that is so divided by extreme individualism and the materialism of our age. We need to create a space where missionary disciples can find a community and a family to nurture their ideals and set their hearts on fire with that transformative energy in the world, in the power of love, to fill minds with the wisdom and the power of the gospel. Let me thank all of you for participating in our Lenten mission. I hope that you will tune in tomorrow. God bless you. Good night. <laughs>